Hello, and welcome to another of PAVE's weekly virtual discussions. I am Ed Niedermeyer. I'm the Communications Director here at Partners for Automated Vehicle Education. And today we are continuing our series on AVs at work. And sort of the broad goal for this series is to highlight, um, you know, a number of the different fields in which uh, automated driving and, and automated vehicles um, are sort of developing uh, uh, opportunities that you may not be aware of. Um, so specifically uh, non-mobility related uh, uh, business opportunities. And specifically this week, we are looking at uh, a really fascinating application of, of automated vehicle technology, and that is agriculture. Um, to help us understand this fascinating field, uh, we are turning to two wonderful experts. Uh, first up, uh, the co-founder and COO of Bear Flag Robotics, uh, a startup in this space, Aubrey Donnellan. Aubrey, welcome. Hello, welcome. And uh, from, uh, from uh, Ottawa, uh, we have Barry Kirk. He's the executive director of Cavco, which is a consulting firm. Welcome, Barry. Okay, here. thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Um, so Barry, I was hoping maybe you could, you could start us up. Uh, you, you've been working with, with cutting edge technology for a long time. Um, and it's, it's always good to sort of establish what the historical context for, for what we're dealing with. Um, and, and clearly, you know, automation and agriculture goes back a long way, maybe not necessarily self-driving tractors and things like that, um, but sort of what is the, the historical context for where we are now in, in automation? Where have we been and, and sort of where are we starting to go now? Believe it or not, if you look at history, the very first reference to a self-driving vehicle of any kind was back in 1898, 123 years ago with Nikola Tesla. Nothing to do with the cars, but the, the famous um, inventor and engineer. And he had a vision for self-driving vehicle, um, which had enough um, comprehension and understanding to drive itself. He had no way to implement that. Um, technology wasn't there, but he had the vision. Um, if we come fast forward, um, there's another big milestone in 2004 what, with what was called the DARPA Challenge. DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and they had a challenge for self-driving cars um, out west, and that was very successful, and that really helped to kickstart the industry. And then, obviously, as you and as everybody realizes, it's really been in the last few years, a lot of different things have come together and moving forward in different applications, different business cases, um, but it's a very exciting era. Yeah, and and Aubrey, I mean, you're you you know you're in a, you're co-founded a startup in this space. Um, what are what are just some of the problems that that you're trying to solve at, at Bearfly um, Robotics uh, in terms of, of just automating? You know, what can automation do for for farmers? Yeah, absolutely. And I can kind of piggyback on the last question too. And first off, Bearfly Robotics, we build autonomous technology for farm tractors. So our whole mission is to increase global food production, decrease the cost to growers and make farming more sustainable through autonomous agriculture and robotics. Um, with that and looking at, and thank you Barry, but looking also at the, the agricultural sphere, those developments were happening in ag at the same time as the DARPA challenge. So in the early 2000s and in military applications using a lot of more advanced GPS technology that was kind of coming in becoming more commercialized and mainstream, you saw this advancement in agriculture. And John Deere really led the way. We, you know, when we go out there and we talk to customers, one of the things, one of the stories we get a lot is, hey, hasn't John Deere been driving autonomous tractors for the last couple of decades? And the technical answer is yes, they have. Um, you know, this technology, which in, in ag, we call it precision agriculture. Um, and it's really utilizing GPS, high precision localization data, to be able to do X, Y, Z on your farm. And the value proposition of that, that, that growers really started adopting and realizing and, and loving back in the early 2000s was you had a reduction of overlap in the passes that you would take in a manned vehicle. And so that would increase your efficiency. It would allow you to do more. It would allow you to reduce like the fertilizers and the pesticides and the inputs that you would put on your farm as well. 
So that, that was transformational technology in agriculture. And I think that those are the building blocks of automation in ag. And of course, it's still required that humans are driving. St today, humans still need to be in the cabs of, of tractors driving. We can talk about why that is and why that's what Bear Flag is working on. It's a hard problem to solve. Um, but that was really the, the genesis, I think, in automation in ag. And it's only gotten better from there, more advanced. Yeah. And, and Barry, I'm how sort of what, what is the context for this in terms of the rest of automation? Like how automated is farming generally? Does it vary a lot from sort of smaller farms to big farms? Sort of where where does where do the tractors piece of this sort of fit in? I, I'm going to leave the, the agriculture side to Aubrey because I think she's the expert. But let me talk about how this fits into the bigger automation space. And uh, there's a lot of different use cases out there. And one of the things I do see is uh, two main categories, what I call non-passenger AVs and passenger AVs. And I see um, in the 2020s that the, uh, the non-passenger AVs, such as automated tractors, are going to really take off in a big way and really be the, um, um, be the vanguard and lay the path for the passenger AVs, which will be deployed in in numbers in the 2030s. And the reason for that is if you've got um, off-road vehicles, whether it be agriculture or mining or forestry, um, then these um, the, the safety issue is different to having a, um, a car in downtown Washington or wherever. And also um, the, the business case is a lot easier to define for agriculture and mining and forestry, and that's where um, will really help to drive things forward very quickly in this decade. And I'll let Aubrey talk about the, uh, how, where it fits in from an agriculture perspective. No, I could, I could not agree more with what you just said, Barry. Um, I think that that's early days in our company. Um, we, we also, we were looking at mining. Um, we briefly looked at on-road vehicles and we saw that there's, there's a couple things that the environment, I think, Ed, you had you had shared with us some topics, and we might get into this a little bit later about the what was it the design uh, space, the environment that that we're developing in, and in some ways it's classified as easier than on road. And I do agree with Barry that from a safety standpoint, it's much easier to develop to rapidly develop and commercialize technology in this space because you can put a lot more controls around these environments than you can on the road. Um, and for instance we're operating between five miles an hour and 12 miles an hour doing these operations. Now these are huge machines. They can totally kill you. You should not walk in front of one of them. Um, but, you know, in a case of our system not working properly or, um, you know, we detect an anomaly in the field, we can just stop, you know, and that's something that you can't really do with an on-road vehicle on the highway. You can't just stop in a situation where you're not sure, where your technology is not sure how to proceed. Um, so the safety scenarios are totally different, um, and, and I think in our favor. And I think that's why Barry and others and ourselves think that this is a great space to, to build out AV technology and adoption. Um, and then on that, how we look at it um, at Bear Flag is, is, you know, early days in the company, we, we found use. So there's use cases where there's so many people that are involved, and it's a wonderful use case for autonomous technology. Um, there are wonderful companies that are working on end effectors, robotics that pick apples off of trees, or they move fruit from one side of a farm to the other. They do very specific, complex tasks that robots can do. Um, we chose to go the route of taking on a task that's done the most times a year across all types of farms. We went the broad case. And so we started focusing on tillage. And we deliver autonomous tillage as a service to growers in California today. And if you know anything about agriculture in California, that's where most of our leafy greens in the United States come from, specialty crops. We're doing 40 plus tillage passes a year. Now that's not the case for every single type of crop, um, but that means that's a hell of a lot of savings that we can provide California growers. And, and from there as our wedge, We've, we plan to expand to other operations like spraying, planting, harvest support, and the like um, that a tractor can do on a farm. And don't forget, Aubrey, and a lot of the leafy greens we eat in Canada. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs>
So it, it's all about the value proposition to the customer that's around you and what's gonna what's gonna save them the most money. And for us, give us, you know, in, in the AV space, it's how many autonomous miles have you driven? Well, we, we haven't driven that many miles because we're going so slow and it's the acres that we farm. Um, and so we're trying to, to maximize that number of acreage for other reasons for development. Yeah, and Barry, um, so it, I wanna, um ask you about the this, this relationship between the operational design domain, you know, where where an, an autonomous vehicle is operating and sort of the, the technology, because um, there's definitely a relationship there, um, but it's sometimes a little little tough to understand. And and um, as Aubrey was saying, I mean, off-road is, is in some ways an easier domain, but it's not without its own, you know, unique challenges as well. Uh, so Barry, can you just sort of introduce us to that, that relationship a little bit between, you know, how the domain shapes the, what the actual technology needs to be. Certainly, Ed. Um, from a technology perspective, there are similarities and differences. Um, I don't know the details of um, all of these machines, but in general, um, any kind of automated vehicle needs sensors. It needs um, some form of artificial intelligence, um, a very reliable operating system, the actual algorithms that drive the vehicle, um, and also, of course, communications, which increasingly means 5G. But um, conceptually, those technologies are the same, whether it's a car or truck or a tractor. But um, if you think about a tractor on a farmer's field and um, with a LIDAR looking ahead and looking around, there are far fewer objects to track. And um, apart from the occasional really fast rabbit, there's not, they're not really moving very quickly. And that's a different specification for the LIDAR than what you would need for um, a car moving at highway speed on an interstate somewhere. So similar technology, but with a different specification and um, because it's a different use case. Yeah, and, and Aubrey, if you could just give us maybe a little bit of detail and, and maybe um, in particular, you know, what are some of the, the challenges that you have to address in this in this use case that maybe someone on a road doesn't, uh, you know, someone, someone driving a, a, developing a, an AV for the road? Absolutely. And Barry, yes, that's, I couldn't agree more. That is the core of our sensor suite of our technology stack. Um, connectivity being one of the most important things. Um, and that is a major challenge for us. Uh, you know, plenty of growers have, have good connectivity, but there's, as we all know, there's tons of places around our world that do not have good connectivity out on farms. Um, so that's a problem we hopefully others will be solving alongside <laughs> as we go to market globally. Um, that's a huge enabler. Um, but in terms of in terms of the sensors we use, it's very similar. And I would say that for he, Barry's completely correct. We don't have to do object tracking so much in our environment, but we are doing environmental monitoring. Um, we we track crops as they grow. So when we when we're in a field before we plant a crop, um, we know what the field looks like um, at a very precise level. And then as you know, the crop is planted and then we move into cultivation um, and start doing operations to the crop all the way through harvest, we can monitor and we do monitor the growth of the crop and the surroundings. And, and we do use some of our AV sensors for that. Um, I think what's really exciting about agriculture too, it's very different than on-road vehicles, is incorporating some other ag-specific sensors. There's soil moisture sensors, there's multispectral sensors that can, can show you how crops are growing um, and the health of those crops. And once you can start to fuse those things together, you can really provide better, better mechanisms and data for growers to make decisions about how to farm. Um, in terms of off-road challenges, dust, you know, like we kick up a lot of dust when we're driving around and we're, we're pulling tillage implements behind us. Um, and so we have, to, we have to manage that with how we ingest our data and use our data coming off of our sensors and cleaning them. We um, incur a lot of vibration on our platform as I'm sure you can imagine. And so that's, that's a factor as well. Um, and additionally, the way, I mean, we're, we're operating on 400 horsepower machines and we pull 20, 30, 40 foot implements um, behind us that are engaging with the ground. So you can imagine you have a vehicle dynamics um, schema of how you expect a vehicle to drive and operate. And while when you're towing something very heavy behind you, um, it doesn't operate the same with each type of implement. So that, that, that's very different than, you know, the same make and model of passenger vehicle that you might expect in similar road conditions. 
um, that we just have to deal with and our control algorithms have to deal with. Um, absolutely. Um, Barry, uh, some of the things that, that Aubrey mentioned there as, as sort of specific challenges in, in the domain that they operate in agriculture uh, sound quite similar to, to some of the things that um, last week's panel, which, which looked at um, uh, AVs at work in, in the mining business, uh, you know, vibration, dust, these sorts of things. What is the relationship between these different um, sort of off-road use cases? Do, is there cross-pollination? Obviously, Aubrey's company focused specifically on agriculture, but but um, yeah, did, are, is this technology sort of crossing over? Um, uh, absolutely. There's a lot of synergy there, um, a lot of cooperation, um, and especially between organizations, between people who are in different um, use cases, but similar technology. It's um, you can share experiences, expertise. It's, it's a win-win situation. And it's not just um, the off-road side. Um, Aubrey was talking about um, problems with dust and so on affecting the, the sensors, the LIDAR and so on. Well, that's not all that different to road vehicles in wintertime. You've got snow and ice, which block sensors, and that's gonna be a big challenge moving forward on the roadside. So it has to be um, tackled. Um, and also as a colleague of mine was um, a while back in the Middle East, um, pre-COVID, and you know, looking at use of automated vehicles in, in um, uh, Saudi Arabia and sand, same sort of thing. You've got blowing sand, lots of sensors, and it's the same sort of tech, same sort of um, impediment, um, impairment that has to be addressed. So there are these um, crossovers and uh, you know, the kind of solutions that are developed hopefully will um, benefit everybody. Yeah. And there's so much, in terms of agriculture, there's so much opportunity for other companies, please do, to develop technology that can, can move across. Um, I mean, you look at the AV space, mapping technology is critical. And there's, it's, it's kind of silly for every AV company to develop their own maps at some points. You have map providers. It's really not the case in ag um, today. I see that will be the case in ag in the future. Um, and in off-road scenarios. Also simulation. You see a lot of wonderful companies that have built great simulation platforms um, to train AI models, but focused on the on-road AV space. We haven't seen so much of that in ag. Believe me, we looked <laughs> um, and we had to build our own. Um, and so I do think that as companies like us start to build these products, we'll see more companies crop up, not, no pun intended, but crop up and provide these kind of cross um, enabling solutions in agriculture. At least I hope if, that's if I If I can segue from there in terms of cross enabling solutions, Aubrey, and we're talking about sensors, um, we've been talking about sensors on the tractors themselves. Um, I, I don't know whether your, your company, Bear Flight, is involved in this, but I see using drones mm -hmm. to survey a crop. Mm -hmm. And if the drone in fact senses an area that has um, more weeds than it should have or whatever, or disease, then it could send a signal to the tractor to go over there and apply the right fertilizer or weed killer or whatever to, to deal with it. And I see a lot of um, uh, use of drones in your space in the future. Absolutely, could not agree more, absolutely. Aubrey, er, earlier you mentioned sort of the role of the human in all this. And, and I think oftentimes people think automation, it's easy to leap straight to, this is about getting rid of the human or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, what is the role of, of the human in, in the automated uh, farm equipment that you're, you're building, but also maybe give us a sense of who your customers are. Are they big companies? Are they mom and pop farmers? Um, you know, if you're not familiar with, with the agricultural industry, you don't necessarily know, you know, who, who should I be imagining sort of, you know, right. working with this equipment? Right, absolutely. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought it back to the customer because Bear Flag is not a research and development project. Um, we built the company to serve growers. And so we have built our technology solely around delivering value and utility to farmers, not for the sake of the technology. And so in that, and to answer your customer question, um, we've served all types of growers. Um, I, I forgot if I mentioned this already, but we chose to go to market as a service. Um, so we're not selling 
our machines today. Um, we are looking at onboarding some customers and potentially um, releasing them to customers to use. Um, but we, did, we chose to go to market as a service for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, um, to be able to create a tight flywheel for our technology development, provide a cohesive quality customer experience um, when a customer calls up Bear Flag to come do a job, we make sure that the job is done to spec and better than a human can do it. We felt that a service was the best business mechanism to do that. And then the third is, and the third is the most important, is safety. Um, do no harm. And that, that is a value of our company. And so we have been conservative um, in, in making sure that we have humans in the loop from a safety standpoint, from a reliability quality standpoint, and just a customer satisfaction standpoint. And how we use how we use humans, um, it, it varies across different tasks that we're doing and environments based on the danger level that we prescribe. So in wide open fields, um, doing a task that we've, we've proven out to a state of reliability, we run unmanned operations without humans um, there. And we will have a remote operator monitoring multiple machines from a totally remote location. That's great. That's like the, the be all end all model. When we're developing a new operation that we're not so confident in, we're still getting bugs out of the system or we're in an environment where say there's a harvesting crew of 40, 50 people that are very close to our tractor. We deem that as a, a more dangerous situation to operate in and we require that a safety driver sits in the seat of our, of our tractor. So it really, it's, it's very dependent on how we assess the risk of the situation. Um, but the ultimate goal and where we're always striving to push to is a remote operator monitoring many machines at one time and increasing the levels of automation that the machine can do for itself while maintaining uh, teleoperation capability to get the machine out of a situation it may not be able to solve itself, if that makes sense. If I can jump in there, Ed, Please, I mean, just to take off from what you're saying there, Aubrey, I think one of the key areas for your customers, for your sector, is going to be the, um, the workforce of the future, which will um, both shrink and change. I mean, it's yes, there's going to be a fewer need for people driving the vehicles, but the work to be done in analyzing what the vehicle should do that day, um, programming it, um, and if you don't, you know, I don't want to be um, getting into trouble with the wrong words here, but you, it's very difficult nowadays to take someone who's say 50 and 60 and spent a lot of their life working by driving tractors and suddenly putting them in, in front of a computer with a joystick. And, you know, the younger people who grew up on games, games and with a joystick and so on, they could adapt to that very easily. But for older people, it's a much greater transition. You've got different technology. And you know, I don't know with your business model there, Aubrey, in terms of maintenance and service, but obviously the, the people who use the tractor will be responsible for maybe first line of service. And that will change with all the technology and software. Um, it's a very different um, servicing requirement compared to um, the sort of um, traditional diesel um, farm tractors. Yes, you said a lot of things there. I think that um, our approach to servicing, you still, you know, tractors still break. We're not solving that problem. Machines still break down, cars break down. And there's a, a great ecosystem of dealerships and support that is that is geared and very good at fixing those problems. And so we made it um, a priority to partner with those people such that if a machine goes down, they can help us. And, and if not, if it's at one of our sensors, we're able to to swap out sensors and things like that. Um, you know, the, the job of driving, and I've driven a tractor for many hours, days in a row, make, making sure that our jobs get done early days in the company. And it's hard, you know, it's, it's really hard on your body and on your mind. It's not enjoyable work. It's the leading cause of deaths and accidents on farms. Um, taking humans out of these jobs, from a tractor standpoint, and when you start talking about pesticides that people are spraying and the chemicals in farming that people are exposed to, you're really increasing safety on farms, just like you are on the road and a lot of companies talk about it. But in a real way, I think a lot of people, no matter what their age would be quite happy and they are happy to adopt technology like this. It's hard work. It's not easy on the body. 
<laughs> but at the same time, you will never, I don't think anybody, neither Bear Flight nor anybody, will ever really be able to make anything, any job, any prof profession, totally safe. Technology will be much safer. But one of the things I've spent years talking about is there's too much hype about um, safety. It's very, very important. But I listened to people from Vision Zero talk about a utopian future with zero collisions, zero deaths. It's a wonderful objective, but totally impossible. And the public um, needs to better understand that the technology will be much safer, but will never be perfect. So that's a wonderful segue to um, my last question of, of the session, which I love both of you to, to give an answer to. And that is, you know, what is your vision for, uh, what is a realistic, you know, vision for, uh, for agriculture and automation specifically in the next 10 and then maybe 20 years or really pick your own time frame? but we would just love to, to understand sort of what you see as being a, a realistic vision for, for what this technology can do in, in agriculture. Uh, Aubrey, we'll start with you. Should I go? Okay. Um, I, th I, I don't think it's a one size fits all. I don't think Bear Flag saves the day. Um, it's a lot of a lot of companies coming together and technologies coming together and tools for growers to be able to do their job and, and stay in business um, and weather some of the challenges that they're facing, which their biggest challenges today are labor availability, getting more production into shorter time frames because of the weather windows that we're seeing. So changing climate, changing labor markets, and, and getting them those tools to deal with those biggest pain points. But those aside, assuming we can solve those pain points that are threats to growers today, there's a world of opportunity to make them more productive, make better decisions based on data, and do more. And I think it's a compilation. Yes, autonomous vehicles are a piece of this puzzle. Robotics are a piece of this puzzle. I think that integrated sensors, soil mo moisture sensors, temperature sensor arrays around farms that are that are chirping real time data about what's going on in the soil. Um, as Barry said, drone data, aerial data um, that's collecting information on a regular basis, scouting, which is currently done by humans on foot um, <laughs> to small parts of the farm. I think all of these are going to come together to not only reduce the costs of growing food, relieving those pain points, but making it more profitable and making farming more sustainable um, into the future to support our global, our global population and food demand. Absolutely. And Barry, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the last word here. Uh, what is your realistic vision of, of automation and agriculture in the next 10 or 20 years? Okay. Um, I started off talking about um, 1898 and Nikola Tesla. And I like to brand myself as a futurist with a passion for history. So uh, having started with a history, let me look ahead to the 2030s. And you know, I've been involved with the mining industry. And um, one of the leaders in automation in mining is Komatsu of Japan. And they've published a vision for a fully automated mine site. Um, and at the start of each day, um, the plans for the day are electronically downloaded to all the various computers, fixed and mobile, and the whole mine operates by itself. And my vision for the 2030s in agriculture is the same, fully automated um, farms, uh, some high level management level um, oversight, but I think the technology is moving that way. And certainly by um, 2030s or shortly beyond, artificial intelligence will be far more advanced than it is today. And that with all the other changes in technology is going to have a big impact. And um, it will be on the one hand, very positive, I think, for the agriculture industry, but also very disruptive. Absolutely. Well, that's uh, fascinating uh, uh, visions of the future from both of you. And um, I want to thank uh, both of our guests for, for taking the time to come and share their deep, deep expertise in these fields. Um, Barry Kirk is the executive director of Cavco. It's a consulting firm. And Aubrey Donnellan is the co-founder and COO of Bear Flag Robotics, an agricultural automation company. Thank you both. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Bye-bye.